What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash and today is October 5th of 2022. Well folks, I hope you are having a fantastic day wherever you are because in today's video, we're gonna be answering a big question. As Bitcoin has charted up about 7% here over the last two days to kick off a strong start to October after a near month long sideways move in price in September, a lot of people are wondering whether or not Bitcoin can really start to charter higher and break out in price. And this tries to go towards a more bigger question that's on the minds of a lot of bulls. Can the Fed start to pivot away from its trajectory of higher interest rates and its reduction of its balance sheet? Can it stop engaging in quantitative tightening, providing relief to the economy and asset prices like Bitcoin? We've got a lot of things to dive into in today's video. If you like it, drop a like and let's go ahead and kick off the conversation. Now, I know over the past few days, this has gotten people a lot of optimism in the market. It's brought us back to where we were back Back in the mid part of September, one of the highest price points we've seen. And while this is definitely exciting to see, guys, I need to be very clear here. While TA is definitely subjective and people have different opinions, if you want my opinion, I gotta say that the bulls are not in charge on the short term time frame or the long term time frame. And here's why it has to do with the clear fact that since back here in June, we've had a descending line of resistance that has lined up perfectly three times in a row here. And until we're able to break above this range as well as the supposed accumulation channel that many people think we're in right now from around this $19,000 to $21,800 range, until we're able to get above there and make it support, we do not have any serious chance for Bitcoin to move higher. And for me personally, if I was to look at potentially dollar cost averaging, betting on crypto or making any big purchases with my cash position, I would want to see these 200 day moving averages, both the simple and the exponential, turned into new support, which is going to take time. And it's why I wouldn't rush into getting into the market. I'm not trying to pick absolute bottoms here. I don't mind paying a slight premium because there's still a very good chance here that this is going to be moving lower. On the weekly chart, we can see that we're in a clear consistent downtrend here in the grand scheme of things, that we are continuing to see way down in resistance on price. But with this descending triangle here with consistent support in the line of resistance, that is a bearish pattern. And the longer these bearish patterns play out, the more significant they are. I can go ahead and mention with a lot of candor that back in 2018, I had a lot of hopium. I was excited for the crypto market to continue moving higher. But at the end of the day, we could see very clearly that we had the same exact pattern here. Similar support, $6,000, the unbreakable level many people like myself thought, and the lower highs here that eventually led to a major final flush here, knocking out a lot of traders, especially those trading on leverage. So again, when we look at the price action here, it's not looking optimistic for the bulls just yet. We need to see more confirmation. And as I mentioned, I'll happily pay a slight premium here. I'm not trying to pick bottoms. Now, outside of that as well, the key thing I want to emphasize is that if you guys are interested in this kind of technical analysis, if you like the coverage we do here on the channel and you want to get access to my technical analysis across few of the major altcoin and crypto pairs, you can definitely set up for a subscription to coin panel, which not only gives you these really great charting views, but on top of that as well, it'll give you access to being able to trade across multiple exchanges from one single interface, accessing a wide range of different altcoin and crypto pairs, as well as being able to get the best order for your trades. So you deal with the least amount of spread on your trades. So if you guys are interested, you can get a discount at the link down below in the description. Make sure to check them out. And outside of that as well, let's take a look at one more of our partner tools here to wrap up our crypto TA portion, and that is BookMath. Now, when we take a look at the upward moving price here over the last seven days, we find something quite interesting. We've gone from around $18,700 towards around $20,000. Nice solid move here for Bitcoin's price, but what is the cumulative volume delta or the market order flow showing us here? We actually have negative market order flow, meaning that more people are market selling rather than market buying. So how does this happen here? Well, the reason why is because on the other portion of the trade, where we've got bids and asks, otherwise known as limit orders, we're seeing that there are a lot more bid orders here than asks on the order book. The asks are practically non-existent at this range. Hence why 
even with negative market order flow here, we're able to start tracking higher here because there are a lot of bids here at the moment, much more comparative to the sellers when we take a look at the order book. So we do have a demand zone here where the bulls have been providing support. It's why we've been holding at this 18 to 19K range for the past couple of months. There is clearly some set of buyers here that are continuing to hold up price. So this is a good charter here for the bulls. But what we need to see for a bull market to kick in is market order flow to really start to turn positive on a consecutive basis. We should be in a position where week by week here on Bookmap, here on the channel, we see essentially that this is gonna be in the green, that market order flow. It should be signaling that the institutions are not just waiting to get their bids filled so they don't incur massive slippage, but rather that they're willing to face that slippage, that spread essentially by buying a large portion of positions at a premium in order to make sure that they get their position filled before the broader trend breaks out. Again, you guys can check out Bookmap as well. It's another great tool, that and Coin Panel, as well as Crypto Quant are the few tools we use here on the channel that I highly recommend. But on top of that, the last thing I wanna dive into for crypto here before we get into this big macro question is the Ethereum price chart. This again is signifying that we're entering into more of a risk off position here as Ethereum has yet again topped out at around the range of resistance of 0 0.082 on the Bitcoin to Ethereum ratio or the ETH to BTC ratio. We think we're still well on our target here towards a 50% decline in its valuation. Now, now that we've talked about crypto here, I wanna go ahead and get into this bigger question, right? All the while, I've been talking a lot about the short-term time frame and the long-term time frame for price action. The bigger question here is whether or not the Fed can truly pivot. And there are really two things that the Fed is looking for in order to start pivoting and going back towards more easing when it comes to monetary policy, or at least stopping its heightened rate hikes as well as its reduction of its balance sheet. And that has to do with two things, cooling inflation, the Fed taming inflation in the economy and making sure that there is more of an equilibrium to supply and demand in the economy. And second off, the other question is whether or not the labor market is softening. Are we seeing, uh, in this case, higher unemployment? Are we seeing lower job openings? Are we starting to see the kind of consumer confidence when it comes to their incomes and spending the economy starting to dwindle here? Unfortunately, whether the Fed uh, likes to admit it or not, they've gotten more comfortable slowly over time. They essentially need to put the economy into a recession. And I think we're already well on our way into one. The question is, how brutal is it going to be? And that is gonna to have to do a lot with what the Fed is gonna to have to do in order to tame inflation. So let's go ahead and dive into some of the charts that can try to answer this for us. So first off, let's go ahead and talk about energy-based commodities like oil and natural gas, which a lot of people keep an eye on here because it does play a role not only for the consumer inflation in the sense of what we spend for you know the prices at the pump as well as our energy bills, but on top of that, it gets baked into a lot of the costs throughout a lot of the things we pay for in the economy, for transportation costs, for travel costs, a lot of different things. So oil and natural gas do hold a lot more weight uh, than we may think at face value. But let's go ahead and take a look here. Well, we got a deviation below the 80 point figure here on uh, the $80 per barrel on light crude oil futures the other day, which is giving a lot of people a lot of excitement here, breaking that big even level at $80 that we we're watching for. But we deviated back up here. And on top of that, as even though we tried to keep relatively neutral and calm the other day about this, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves about a potential trend reversal back to the upside. I have to say, we've had a continuation here all the while equities have been popping up and Bitcoin's been popping up. Oil has been growing up just as quick here, back up to 86.5 here, back to where it was back in the mid part of August. So this is not what the Federal Reserve wants to see here. It should be crippling oil and natural gas with these current rate hikes. This essentially means that the Fed is not tightening enough. We need to see a clear descending line here for oil. And we're starting to see a potential trend deviation here. If this continues up towards, say, $95 per barrel, you've got a good chance for this to continue breaking out. So again, either way here, it's going to mean that if you're looking for a reduction in month-over-month -month inflation with oil prices back here up to where they were in mid-August, oil's not going to help you here. you got to get a lot of reduction in other things in the economy in the sense of their costs in order to get that CPI or the PCE, one of the other inflation measurements that the Fed and Jerome Powell has signified with significant importance, which also went up month over month, bear in mind. 
with the recent reading. We need to start seeing other things start to decline here. I can't tell you guys what's going to be declining here if oil is picking up this much. It shows me that demand isn't cooling yet. Take a look at natural gas here, right? Natural gas, all the while, has been on a decline here since August. Very clear here. We saw the exact same thing here happen in July. And on top of that, we are setting in a higher range of support, similar to that where we were back in April. So it is very critical to understand that we have not seen the kind of decline that the Fed needs on energy-based commodities. It showcases here that they have not been able to cool demand. Energy-based commodities are signaling that the Fed has not done enough yet and that it cannot end tightening. It cannot start to pivot. So that's one area where the bears clearly win here. Now, the next thing we need to talk about is taking a look at the mortgage market. Essentially speaking, the cost to borrow here and the cost of living expenditures. This is a massive, massive portion of the CPI as well as the PCE. It's about 20% of the PCE for the CPI. I think it's even higher. I think it's around about 40, uh, 40%, roughly speaking. So we need to understand what the cost of living is looking like. Well, inadvertently, in the short term, with the Federal Reserve increasing the cost of capital in the economy, it is also increasing mortgage rates. And we are at our highest range here we have seen since practically 2006. Also similar levels. If we tick up towards around 7%, the highest level since 2001 in over 20 years for mortgage rates. Now, there are some people who have already gotten those fixed rate mortgages at 2%. They're the lucky ones. But people who are going out and buying out houses on the market or people who are renting from landlords who have variable rate mortgages, they are in a lot of trouble here. The cost of living is not going down here with increased uh, increased mortgage rates, essentially speaking, much more than any potential decline in prices in the housing market, which we just really haven't seen much yet. So likewise, similar to energy-based commodities, the Fed is going to have to tighten even more here. They're going to have to cripple demand in the economy until housing prices really start to decline here, essentially. And therefore, Rents as well start to go down. That's a big expenditure for the end consumer here. A lot of people are footing the bill of their landlords with the mortgage financing that go, go into buying all of these rental properties. And we can start to see here that until we start to see a lot of delinquencies, we start to see a lot of people essentially uh, get foreclosed on, right? And we're starting to see those signals here from the Vanguard Mortgage Backed Securities ETF. We're starting to see the Vanek Mortgage, uh, uh, basically Real Estate Investment Trust ETF. These are basically passive investing ETFs on rental properties. Until we start to see these go towards lower levels here, signifying that a lot of these mortgages are going to go belly up. A lot of people are not going to be able to meet to the financing obligations that they have that is essentially going to be the moment where we can start to get optimistic we have not seen that bottoming just yet we are in a clear downturn here we've had many weeks like this like we've had just this past week you know another five percent move we had a ten percent move back here in june had a couple of weekly moves here where we rolled over just as quick so we've got a lot of grounds to make up for and are likely going to continue to move lower here just take a look at the monthly here take a look at the quarterly time frame, you'll start to see that the trend is very clear and it is not on the side of the bulls just yet. We need to see much more confirmation. So this is, again, another indicator of the bears being in the lead here when it comes to the topic of inflation. So these are really the two major categories here. But maybe there's some signs of hope here, as we've seen some of the best days since back in July, even after one of the worst performances in the first nine months of the year since 19. 31. A lot of people like to focus on the headlines. I like to dive into the paragraphs. I like to figure out the intimate details here that don't get talked about in the headlines, right? Because everyone's looking for hope right now. We've had a lot of pain here in the economy. I understand a lot of people want to see some optimism in the market, but we have to understand here that this is the third worst performance in the first nine months since 1931. The other times this happened, 2008, 1974 and of course 1931 during the Great Depression. This is why we're very confident of a 50% plus correction in equities at a minimum, right? That's a conservative ask according to history. If this is the end of a secular bull market, if the Fed cannot come to the rescue. Now, on this topic of pivoting though, we have one last big question to answer. And that is whether or not the labor market is starting to soften. And this is where the bulls have got some benefit. 
looking back here, we saw a significant decline. The total number was over a million job openings shut off month over month here. And that's got a lot of people excited here, a softening labor market. But I got to be honest with you all, if you just simply take a look at the chart here, we've got a long way to go down. Now, I'm not saying the Fed is one, you know, definitely does not want to take it down here to 0.3 jobs per unemployed worker. I don't think they're looking for that much pain, but we're going to need a lower level than this. I'm not someone who wants to see pain in the economy, but after years and years of good times and such an exacerbated level the likes, which we have never seen here over the past few decades in job openings, an incredibly strong labor market in the sense of the amount of opportunities, right? We are going to see a much further decline here before we get any kind of relief here from the Fed. This is not the one month that the Fed needs to see a decline. They need to see multiple months. They need to see multiple months of the PCE going down, getting down to their target of 2%, which we are still far away from. This means that the two things that people are hoping for here as signs that the Fed may pivot are premature and they have a lot further to go down here. I know people might have different opinions of it, but folks, if we simply just take a look here again at the energy-based commodities, if we take a look at those mortgage rates, cost of living is not going down. The labor market is still incredibly strong compared to where it's been, at least in the sense of the metrics that the Fed is following. Jerome Powell is not satisfied just yet. And he is gun hone on maintaining what little reputation the Fed still has at being able to potentially cool this issue. And until we get serious about cooling inflation, until Jerome Powell really gets into the driver's seat and starts doing those 100 basis point hikes, until he starts heavily reducing the balance sheet and getting rid of this funny money in the economy, shutting everyone up and showcasing that he is in charge, we cannot get a sustained recovery in asset prices for the long term, plain and simple. So again, I don't wanna to be too negative here, guys. We are looking for a whole range of opportunity, both in equities and in the crypto market in the coming months. And this is the period of time here as we set our price levels here, as we look for discount opportunities, we look for the plays that could really start to shine here in the next coming years, during the next bull market. We should always be thinking two steps ahead, not two steps behind. What kind of plays out there are gonna be really exciting? And while I'm definitely looking at Bitcoin and Ethereum, I'm also looking at the altcoin space and trying to find plays that are holding up well or have promising fundamentals. And one of those is Kava Network. Now you guys know we've talked about Kava if you're a routine viewer here on the channel. Kava is a layer one protocol that merges the Cosmos SDK with the Ethereum virtual machine bringing two of the most powerful environments and developer tools into one singular ecosystem with high throughput and scalability. Now, if you guys haven't heard already, Kava Network has some big news. They just launched a partnership uh, with Sushi, which is one of the largest automated market makers or decentralized exchanges in the crypto space, and they have now deployed Sushi 2.0 into the Kava network with the same user experience that many of you have come to know and love that allows you to swap from one token to another. This is again one of the many Kava Rise partners that have joined the network and Kava has been continuously surrounded by some of the largest names from Curve as well as Sushi and many other DeFi protocols as well as new ones that have started to come up and make Kava a really standout network in the DeFi space. Now, if you guys haven't heard already, they've launched a Kava and Sushi Rewards program that's going live in seven days. So if you, again, are someone who holds Kava, again, this is a way where you can start to get yield within the Kava ecosystem, get even more Kava tokens for participating. And essentially, so long as you're participating in the network and building on top of the network, this is gonna be a majority user developer owned network, not an investor network. So essentially speaking, if you're participating, you're gonna benefit a lot more here if you're ever thinking about buying any Kava tokens or participating within the ecosystem. Now, above all though, if you guys aren't ready to make an investment yet or participate in the ecosystem, I definitely recommend you check out their Twitter page. Just simply follow them for any major updates. They've got a lot of exciting things coming out. The projects that build in the bear market are the ones that excite me the most personally. It's just my general take. I'm not saying that you guys need to go out there and buy Kava or anything, but for protocols like Kava, like Radix, a lot of the plays we watch here on the channel, those are the kind of layer ones that excite me because they're doing something different and they don't care about it being the bear market. They're continuously building so that value can be realized in the next bull run. 
that's the kind of mindset. If you are maintaining optimistic, that's the mindset you got to keep towards. Have that year, two year long vision and get ready for the next wave as we continue to wait and watch to see what happens in the broader macro environment. But that's it for today's video, everyone. Thank you all so much for watching. If you like this video, drop a like, consider subscribing, hit that bell icon. And until the next video, I'll see you all in the next one. Take care, everyone.